Good morning. My name is David Purdy, and I'm the chairperson of the Harwich Housing Committee. From time to time over the last couple of years, uh, through the generosity of Channel 18, we have brought you information about housing here in Harwich and uh, talked with you about some of the issues relative to affordable housing here in the town of Harwich. And uh, today we have a very, very exciting uh, new housing development that we want to talk with you about, the Habitat for Humanity uh, uh, project, which is going to be starting a little later on in the spring up on the Oak Street Extension. And I'm pleased to have with us this morning Vicki Goldsmith, who's the executive director of Habitat for Humanity of Cape Cod. That's I think right. the yep. exact title. And also Dawn Walnut, who is uh, in charge of volunteer services for Habitat. So thank you both for coming. We're going to spend our half hour uh, talking about Habitat and this new wonderful project here in town. Um, Vicki, let me start with you. Can you give us a little bit of the history of Habitat for Humanity here on Cape Cod? I, I think most people probably know the name Habitat for Humanity, but they might not know the extent of the work that Habitat has done here on Cape Cod. And then maybe talk a little bit more about uh, specifically Harwich and the number of houses that you've uh, constructed here in Harwich. Okay, great. Well, um, well, Habitat has been on the Cape since the late 80s. It was organized in the 1988-1989 um, uh, time frame and kind of a combination of there were a couple of local people, one who just passed away, um, Dick Sewell and his wife who had been volunteers with Habitat International. So they were, they were bringing the word of this new exciting program. There were only affiliates in a few states in the United States at that time. And they had a new program of building homes, working in partnership with the family who would mm -hmm. uh, be able to purchase the home at the end. It gave uh, communities the opportunity to volunteer and build the homes, the family the opportunity to build the home and uh, invest their sweat equity. And then it was sold at that time at, at a no interest mortgage. And it was just a fabulous new program um, that was kind of sweeping the country um, as to how to, uh, communities mm -hmm. could help provide affordable homes for people who had critical housing needs. And then part of the, the fire and steam at that time was some uh, local people who really needed homes and they challenged uh, those volunteers and said, well, why can't we do that program right here? So mm -hmm. that really speaks to the beginnings of Habitat. Uh, it brings us up to today where we uh, will be dedicating our 100th home in mm -hmm. the next spring in 2016. So we've completed and sold over 90 homes. And we've built in all 15 towns. And this year, uh, we'll be building again in the town of Harwich. Right. How many, ta uh, how many of those 100 houses uh, are here in ha Harwich? I've, I'm going to say, f uh, well, uh, nine Habitat for Humanity homes, but 14 homes, we've affordable homes we've developed all together here in Harwich. We did one in our earlier days, and then in 2009, we built out a small neighborhood, Gomes mm -hmm. Way in mm -hmm. Harwich, mm -hmm. and eight of those we did in the traditional Habitat for Humanity model. And we did, we contracted out, which is not the habitat model, but because we were doing this larger neighborhood, right. we contracted out five homes and they were still sold as affordable homes. So we've really provided for 14 families here in the okay. town of Harwich. How, how typical is, was the Gomes Way project? Not very typical for habitat, I guess, because habitat, I mean, my sense of habitat had always been you built a house here, you built a house ah. there and so on. But now it seems as though you're building uh, Sure. Well, I think any Habitat for Humanity in their earliest days, they start with the one home and the one there. But mm -hmm. then a lot of um, habitats across the country do evolve to having the capacity to building blocks or mm -hmm. neighborhoods, et cetera. So we're, we've moved into the period where we're building a little three home neighborhood, maybe two homes at once in one place at Gomes Way, as I say, 13. 13 yeah. And now uh, Oak Street in Harwich, that will be a seven home 
neighborhood, and it's really, it's a continuation of an established neighborhood, but we'll have a, we're building down a street, another seven homes, and mm -hmm. they'll all be Habitat for Humanity homes. Now, what are some of the unique characteristics about Habitat for Humanity that uh, sort of differentiate it from other kinds of affordable housing? Um, I would say the really deep investment in partnership by the community and with the community and also the involvement and empowerment of the families um, who, with whom you're building. And it moves into Dawn's area a little because she's responsible for enrolling and organizing wow. volunteers. I mean, how do you build a house? I mean, think of it, construct a house with volunteers, most mm. of whom have had no previous experience. So, so the, there's the volunteer element and then there's our requirement that the family heavily invest sweat equity and they're building right alongside with, with the people um, who are volunteering on their So homes. that's one of the unique characteristics of Habitat as distinct from uh, another developer who comes in and, and, and does everything, subcontracts out and so on. So one of the unique characteristics of Habitat is that not just the community involvement but or, or the involvement of the, as well as the involvement of the person or family themselves in terms mm -hmm. of uh, sweat equity, is that Absolutely, is that right? right. Well, uh, tell us about the volunteer dimension of this then, Dawn. What, well, I always what say that that aspect of it, the fact that community volunteers are building the house and that the homeowners themselves are helping to build their own home, creates something a little special on, mm -hmm. the, job mm -hmm. on the job site itself. At the construction site, you see all sorts of a lot of camaraderie, you see relationships being built. Um, the volunteers get to know each other pretty well sometimes, and the volunteers and homeowners form real tight bonds. Uh, and it, it brings it to a different level. It's, it's um, more than just building a structure right, because right. of that. And, and it also, um, the camaraderie that you talk about, mm -hmm. that's very different than, a, again, a, a a commercial developer, as it were, who would go in and build even affordable houses, but they just come in, they do the work, and, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, are there any, one of the things that I sort of enjoy are the, um, the testimonies or witness of some of the people who have uh, been the recipients of the homes. We, you've had them at, um, at the Lutheran Church here in town and mm -hmm. perhaps other places too, but when people get together at the end of the process and talk about what it's meant, and a lot of that is to do with the fact that many people from the community are involved in this, not just writing checks, but mm -hmm. uh, putting their sweat and uh, time into this. Well, you know, a lot of the families we work with have not had a lot of good breaks in life. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have come from hard times, uh, sometimes generationally, sometimes in the way, you know, they came up or just in their, their own their own young adult lives. Mm -hmm. And so they enter into this approximate one year period of being surrounded by love. Mm -hmm. And they will mm -hmm. often speak of very eloquently about having their faith in humankind restored, mm -hmm. about how, how powerful that element was. The, the, when we, de we, kind of, we do a little debrief with them towards the end of the process, and um, they always speak very powerfully about the volunteers, that the, the most important thing during the process, certainly for them, is, uh, is uh, and astounding thing is the fact that people voluntarily <laughs> give of their time mm -hmm. so that their family may have a mm -hmm. home. So it's, it's a very powerful message. The, community sends to these neighbors living amongst mm -hmm. us who mm -hmm. are living in situations where they're moving many times while raising their kids. They're uh, burdened by rent payments that mean they can't afford other basics in life, uh, living in substandard conditions. So it's, it's very powerful in that sense. Good. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the particular uh, uh, development going on this spring and summer and mm -hmm. probably into the fall as well on Oak Street Extension. Um, what um, you say there's seven units uh, what will these houses look like um, are they only for uh, people with children are there single sure, persons can, or yeah, what, what no, kind of combination so, first of all the location we're building on Oak Street and it's the part of Oak Street that um, is off of uh, long 
Pond, Pond Road. Road. <laughs> Um, and it goes behind the tech school. So um, it's where Oak Street would go if the Mid Cape Highway hadn't been built. And so you need to go down 124 along Pond Road or come from the other direction. Oak Street, and then we're extending Oak Street where it heads out for a water tower there. And we're working with the town to, to pave the section of the road that had been a dirt road before. So there'll be seven homes. Uh, four of them will be a typical ranch style mm -hmm. home. Um, and three of them will be uh, Cape. Cape style, so the two-story, very typical uh, designs, mm -hmm. clapboards in the front, shingles on the side, um, and uh, three of them will be two-bedroom homes and four three-bedroom homes. So we have part of our process. We know we will start construction late spring, early summer. I think we're still thinking late June for wall raising. Keep your fingers the, the winter delayed some of the site work. <laughs> we, uh, we already had the foundations in in the fall, but we couldn't get back to the site to finish a few things, nor could the town with some of the infrastructure. But um, our ranch, we think it's attractive. I provided a picture ahead of time, so maybe they'll be able to show it. But it's, um, I think uh, it's a two bedroom ranch. It has a little porch in the, a little farmer's porch in the front. Um, and then the three bedroom, of course, just a slightly larger version of that. And the capes have a little deck on the back and it's just mm -hmm. a attractive, typical Cape Cod uh, design. Uh, the families, um, as it happens, there is a um, preference for in the selection for families who will maximize the use of the home or mm -hmm. all the bedrooms. So in this instance, um, all the families have between one and Three, three, three children. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep. we, we already know who they all are because they were um, went through the application process in time to be ready to build with us. So one, two, or three kids, and um, they're all from around this area at this time: Harwich, Chatham, Dennis. But um, mm -hmm. more, you know, easily more than half of them um, met the. Um, Harwich preference requirements, um, not all, but almost all. And um, uh, so they're working locally, uh, several in the construction trades, either building or landscaping, mm -hmm. several in restore supermarkets and donut shops mm -hmm. and convenience stores. Mm -hmm. And so really people who live or work mm -hmm. locally. Um, I was going to ask you, how <coughs> do people hear about the availability of a Habitat home and what, uh, what kind of qualifications does a person or a family need to be able to apply and, um, and receive um, a Habitat home? And then I want to ask you about mortgage payments and all that sort of stuff. But first, how, how do people qualify for a, a Habitat home? Oh, okay, so they qualify, our criteria have to do with um, having some kind of critical need for affordable housing, an affordable home, um, having the ability to pay our mortgage, which will be between 650 and 750 a month, depending on the house size. So they, on the one hand, they need to have the ability and mm -hmm. they need to show that they have stability of income and decent enough credit that we can have confidence they'll pay the mortgage. Um, but at the same time, we have maximum income requirements. So for example, for applications that we have available for homes <coughs> we're doing now, a family of four would not uh, be able to have a, a gross income more than 53,463 um, mm -hmm. a year. So that's 65% of the median income. And those requirements change from time to time. Um, Who sets those requirements? Habitat or the state or well, how does that work? Well, HUD, uh, the <laughs> okay. National right. Housing uh, Department sets what median incomes are and then our affiliate has chosen to endeavor to serve people up to either 60 or 65 percent of median income depending on the, the project. And that's another thing that's unique about Habitat. We really try to serve people or provide an opportunity to people at the lowest possible income that we can mm -hmm. do and still make the finances work right. because we have to pay for the you know the houses mm -hmm. through different means so and uh, willingness to partner that they will do the sweat equity with us and they will take pre purchase <coughs> workshops so um, people hear about it uh, radio newspaper and so forth but more and more we now encourage interested 
um, future applicants to subscribe to our e-news because we always announce application availability in our e-news. We send letters and flyers to all existing uh, Habitat homeowners so they'll spread the, the word amongst their friends and colleagues. We send flyers home with the kids at school. We send notices to the faith congregations. Mm -hmm. Did I miss Facebook? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. social media has become very uh, a, a high, sure, sure. A high way of getting the word out. Yeah. Now you said something about a, a workshop, so the family or person who's purchasing the home has some kind of a a, a training uh, in managing how to pay and what when taxes are due and those sorts of things? Right. Or, or we, have, we have a series of pre-purchase <coughs> uh, workshops, but two of them, one is a group workshop given by a local uh, bank vice president who goes over, it's called, uh, I think, uh, Budgeting for Successful oh, uh, Home Ownership. Okay. So they have a, a group class, and she also hands them a workbook for them to fill out with all their predictable income every expense um, from buying a bottle of water once a week to uh, and coffee twice a week <laughs> to what all their bills are, et cetera, et cetera, and their ha housing payment. And then they have an individual meeting with her to work on their budget and see what their goals are because now they will have a goal of saving enough to have their septic system pumped every you know, three years, mm -hmm. and maybe they want a pet, and that's not inexpensive now. Maybe they wish to take a vacation once every two years. So everything goes in that budget, and it's a great learning experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's financial management. Uh, we have a home maintenance uh, part of the course. Oh, yeah. uh, we prepare yeah. them for the closing. So the whole series, wow. yeah. And they're not alone during all of that. They have volunteer family partners who work with them, and that's another volunteer job that we have with Habitat for Humanity, and they're gonna be by their side for the entire time that they're building their home and for one year after they move in. Tell me a bit more about that because you emailed me and asked me if I could find uh, oh. these family partners mm -hmm. and I frankly <laughs> didn't know exactly what you were talking about. So could you fill us in a little bit more about what is the family partner and how does what kind of role do they play? The family partner is going to work with each individual homeowner family to help them budget their sweat mm -hmm. equity hours. Mm -hmm. That's one of their primary roles. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I'm going to get back to that. Yeah. But but if I'm a single woman with two kids or something, how am I supposed to? And I have a job yes. or two jobs or exactly. whatever. How do I how do I participate in in the sweat equity part of this? Well, we build a house a lot slower than a contractor would. So when we say we take 8 to 12 months, one of the reasons for that is because people can come once a week, they work it out with their employer, they find a way to do it, and mm -hmm. they can still meet that sweat equity requirement. Well, they can way. work on weekends if yes. they have a job that's We weekdays. pretty much always work one weekday and one weekend day on a, on a build. So, okay. yeah, the family partner is also going to accompany them to the workshops that we talked about, that Vicki talked about. Mm -hmm. um, the family partner's there if something happens in their lives, sometimes just a sounding ear and mm -hmm. also communication between us at the Habitat office and the families themselves. And then check in with them, make sure that they're doing okay once they move into their house. Yeah, because things happen in houses, even yeah. brand new houses, right? Right, <laughs> right. And, you know, we have a standard builder's <coughs> warranty for the first year, but they do need to, the partner can check in with them. Is everything okay? Sometimes they don't want to bother us. They've been so grateful yeah. and there's some little problem. Well, we want to know about that little problem. <laughs> so we, yeah. it's reported in the first year and, and we can we can take care of it. So the uh, family partner uh, volunteer is extremely important and another unique thing to have that's, at that. That's terrific. And that's another way to involve the community because mm -hmm. the family partner comes from the community and is part of the whole, Absolutely. whole network of relationships. People tell me it's a very rewarding job. They I love that. it. Oh, yeah. good, good. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, since we're sort of on that whole issue of the involvement of the whole community in the process is, Quite frankly, uh, as we know, uh, sometimes people in a neighborhood are concerned about an, an affordable housing home or homes uh, coming to their neighborhood. They, they don't, well, there's some resistance sometimes to that. I don't want to stress that overly, but nonetheless, uh, we know it's uh, true. We know it's true and <laughs> we hear about it. So how, are there other ways in which as you 
begin a uh, development, uh, that you relate to the local neighborhood uh, to allay some of those fears and to help them understand what this is all about and so on? Well, you know, we always, um, our practice currently, I'll say, because it's evolved over time, though, is as we are getting ready to go before the different planning boards, mm -hmm. the Zoning Board of Appeals, we'll send the neighbors a copy of the plans mm -hmm. that we are going to be bringing to the town. Uh, we will provide them with the phone number and contact information for our pre-permitting specialist so they can call if they have questions. She'll meet them out at the site, um, answer questions, and explain what we're planning to do. Um, so we, we try to keep the neighbors informed to give them an opportunity to comment. In some instances, um, there's comments they make that can shape the proposal somewhat. So we really try to stay in good communication, also to write them again when we're about to begin construction, that kind of thing. And so I, I think that we really endeavor to um, build something that's very, um, that's the word I'm looking for, but you know, we're trying to take good care of the people who will be living in the home, so they'll have pride of home ownership. We want it to be attractive for the neighborhood. I tend to find that what people are deeply sad about is that you're taking down a patch of woods mm, near to them. Yeah, right. And so the two things we can't do much about is that sadness about taking down a patch of mm -hmm, woods true. or if there's any kind of deep prejudice about the people who we serve, the people we'll be providing an opportunity mm -hmm. to. We do let people know these are folks are your neighbors already. They're somewhere in Harwich well, somewhere or the neighboring Harwich towns. Anyway, yeah. They're living right here. They're working right here. Um, so there's no big alien thing to be uh, scared of, but you know, people sometimes it, it takes uh, once everything is established and people have moved in that people kind of breathe easy and they see, well, that nothing yeah. really dramatic has happened here. I just have some new neighbors. Right. Sometimes the <laughs> actual physical development itself, uh, I remember in the Gomes Way project, mm -hmm. it was 11 acres and, and certainly 11 acres of trees coming down would be a scary proposition for right. anybody. Absolutely. But what you did there was there was a buffer zone right. around it, trees, right. um, so on and so forth. Um, do, do you try to do that kind of physical thing also? Um, because you, this is only a couple of acres. How many acres is this? A two point something acres you're building? Oh, don't do that to me. Okay, I think right. it is. I think and, it is and, about anyway. three acres, though. Two point eight or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Well, you know, to do a green buffer is quite common for us um, to actually uh, put land in a buffer zone. That's a different thing, and not all sites allow for it. Mm. But often, uh, you know, in this instance, we are able to do some planting between the nearest neighbor and the houses. Uh, Fences. We did a little of that in on Gomes Way because of the way lights were going to hit as, and that seemed yeah, a very that, yeah, reasonable a request by that, a neighbor. Yeah. As people curved in, the lights <coughs> were going to be headed yeah. right into. So we we did a we didn't certainly we don't want to uh, enclose our uh, homes in a mm -hmm. ghetto like fashion, right. but to put up a small um, section of fencing so that lights wouldn't go directly right. into someone's. Uh, home, that was quite a reasonable request. Right. And after that, if neighbors want more privacy, then we feel it's up to the person who wants the privacy to put up the fence. We right. don't feel we should have to enclose, you know, every yard yeah. that we do. Well, I hadn't, <laughs> I, I wasn't <laughs> thinking about the sort of ghettoization so much as I was when you talked about yeah. losing the trees, for example, someone's lived in near a, oh, yeah. no, it's, you know, with all the trees uh, that they've had it to their advantage, and yeah. now all of a sudden, the bulldozers come in, and uh, yeah. but you're trying to. That's a big consideration yeah. in site plan. We have a neighborhood we're working with right now up in uh, Wellfleet, and it's very challenging because, however, we nestle the homes, it affects neighbors on one side of the site in a different way than another mm -hmm. side, and so, you know, it's affected. In uh, being in conversation with the neighbors, has really affected everything about that site. Uh, we are able to put in a buffer zone on one side. It has to do with how we're winding the road in, and uh, we can't make everyone 100 percent happy, but we've certainly heard every consideration, and we've tried to meet them as well as we can. Yeah. I, I'm, we're going to run out of town okay. here, time here in a couple of minutes, <laughs> believe it or not. And so I just want to ask one or two more questions. Um, the uh, people who uh, well, let me ask you this question, Dawn, about volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, 
what are some of the ways that people can get involved and how would they? Is there going to be a meeting here in town when mm -hmm. everyone who wants to volunteer can come in? Uh, is there a place that someone who can't physically do much? Uh, I, I know that some of the churches provide a, 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 a refreshments yes. and so on. You can always write a check too, I suppose. But what are some ways in which people can be involved in this particular project? Uh, Luckily, we make it very, very easy. Um, <laughs> there are lots of different types of volunteer jobs. People do provide refreshments. We need quilters to help make housewarming gifts, all kinds oh, gosh, of different things. And idea. people can contact me and, and let me know what they're interested in. And I can certainly um, let them know what the scope of those are. But I'd say 90% of the people who call me really are interested in construction volunteering. So there's no training required. We don't, we don't make that difficult at all. You can actually sign up for a construction shift online if that's your preference, or you can do it by calling me. The only thing we do ask is that you sign up for a shift ahead of time. It's not a walk-in kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. We, we limit the numbers of who can be there on any given day, and that's for safety. And so you do have to sign up ahead of time. Mm -hmm. But we have a login system called Volunteer Up which you can find very easily from our website. And that one takes you directly to a calendar and you literally click a button saying sign up and you're, you're on the shift for that day. Now, you said something about weekday and weekend. Mm -hmm. Do you, are the, is the build itself going on all week long? No, we will build, volunteers can come on, this for this particular site it will be Tuesdays and Saturdays, we oh, do know the schedule, and, I, and we don't know exactly when we're starting yet, but sometime in June we will have what we call a community kickoff, and that will be a local come get information sort of event, mm -hmm. find out when we're starting, find out more about the kinds of jobs available and how to sign up specifically, okay. but you don't have to come to the kickoff to volunteer, oh, no. so oh, yeah. No. Good, good. Okay, so you think for folks out there who might be interested, is there a phone number, website, um, and you don't know the date yet of the of the kickoff? As it will be in June, It'll so in June. we okay. recommend people as that e-newsletter will announce it, and our Facebook page will announce it. Those are good ways to stay in the loop. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other information you want to share about uh, Habitat? And well, this particular build. Well, one thing I should mention in case anyone is watching who has either themselves or a relative or a young friend or someone they know mm -hmm. through uh, that person's employment is we do have applications open right now for a three-bedroom home in the town of East Ham and for two two-bedroom homes in the town of Barnstable. So if you know mm -hmm. a family that needs a little that needs a home and also needs a little encouragement, mm -hmm. you can let them know. They can call our office or go mm -hmm. on our website for information about those homes. Good. So Good. I guess that and the fact that we do need and welcome volunteers and people to get involved and they can certainly call Dawn at 508-362-3559 or check our website at habitatcapecod.org. Um, and we're very, and I, I should mention, this is Harwich Television, Harwich is a great town for us to work in. It's a generous town and, um, you know, the town holds us to the various requirements that any builder should be held to, mm -hmm. but uh, town staff can make things um, <laughs> cooperative and easy for you or they can give you a tough time. And, we, you know, we feel that the town uh, technical staff is really great with us. The faith community is great with mm -hmm. us, the general community, the town leadership. So I do want to make a point of saying this, that uh, the reason we're able, we're working in Harwich this year is because uh, Harwich opens the door for us. Good. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Yeah, Thank no, you. it's important. Thank not every not every town is like that. Well, so you've got you've been good neighbors to us, and so I guess the town wants to continue being good, good neighbors for you. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much, thank Dave, you. for the opportunity very, to speak with everybody this morning. And, and, and we'll have to you. do this again because I got about 18 more questions that we didn't get to. <laughs> okay. But maybe just before or around the time the build begins, we can get together and you can share some more information and tell us how things are going in terms of numbers of volunteers and that sort of thing. You know, one thing Absolutely. the town might like to film is the Blitz build. I should have been oh. in. We're doing the Blitz in. It's a one week uh, that uh, will be built out by professionals uh, who are members and friends of the Home Builders and Remodelers Association of Cape Cod. It will be in September and uh, that might be a great, great program. Good. Okay. We'll look forward to that too. Thank you so much and thank you folks out there for uh, tuning in and listening and watching and uh, 
stay tuned for more uh, information about the Habitat uh, project that's going up over the summer. Thanks.